another week, another team to talk, so pretty much an unofficial dev diary for EU5. And I think today's team to talk is yet another confirmation. This is EU5. By the new maps that you'll see, including this, I'll go get into this a bit later, and also a bit talks about the different mechanics of the government in game. Obviously, they're saying that this is just high level and vision, and they'll go a bit more into details a bit later. But uh, first thing first, they are presenting us five government types that will be present in the game. And you'll see that there's monarchy with legitimacy, republic with republican tradition, theocracy with devotion, step horde with horde unity, as well as a tribe with tribal cohesion. So you'll see that, isn't it just yelling at your face, hey, we are EU5, because these are pretty much the same as in EU4. There's one new thing that I don't think was in EU4, is a tribal cohesion. I might be wrong because I'm not playing as tribes. They're also mentioning that uh, it's the same as in U4, that some government types have access to special actions, while the others don't. So, for example, uh, Republic does not have access to re royal marriages, while Step Horde has a different view on how to war, peace, and conquer lands. I'm really curious how it's gonna look like, because in U4, while raising is an amazing feature, it's also still utterly broken and it's allowing horse to expand infinitely because they have infinite mana from raising. And there's an illustration from the game and uh, as previously I'll go through the comment section and I believe uh, Johan said that it might be one of the menu screens that they will be using. So here to give a country a name we will be combining the government type, country rank, government reform and local flavor. So for example we'll have Crown of Aragon, another confirmation it is very likely EU5, Kingdom of Sweden, Principality of Wales, but there will be uh, also some other countries that are not really based on only locations on the map though, so we'll see about that. Again, uh, confirmation that there's a ruler, if uh, a legitimate heir is uh, not old enough, there will be a regency, nothing new. We are also getting uh, some sneak peek on how the estates will work. And it is mentioned here that it is the most defining part of the government. And I think there will be later mentioned in the comment section that they want to make it a bit different than in U4. Well, in U4, the estates sometimes feel just a little bit like here is country and here are the estates. And right now in the EU5, they want to connect this to a bit more. There will be a full connection between the population and the estates. Uh, so it is super important, especially that you saw that there are specific estates being in your population in the previous dev diary and keeping the estates satisfied while keeping their power slow is an important part of the gameplay loop well that's actually just like in u4 you want the loyalty high and influence to be maybe not super low but it be around 60 percent so you get the right bonuses in this game estates are also active entities and will do things on their own if they get enough power. I mean, and you see here two government reforms, one culture specific and one government specific. So we've got Pashas, obviously for uh, the Ottomans, increasing nobles' power and decreasing unrest. So you see already that most probably both influence, in this case called power of the estate, is gonna work a bit different than in U4, because in U4 it was between 0 and 100%. This is plus 100 from Pashas, so I assume it's gonna be a different ranking. And same from unrest, because minus 10 unrest is crazy high in U4, so it's probably gonna be calculated a bit differently in U5. We've got Autocracy, where there's monthly progress to Aristocracy, whatever it means, and Crown Power plus 10%. As time passes, different government reforms and reform slots will be available. They can also be based on tech, culture, or religion. And that is... A lot of people already like uh, thinking like, how are they gonna deal with the fact that the game will start in 14th century? How we are gonna see colonization? Are we gonna play until revolutions? Because between 1337 and 1820, there's so much things that happened, so much reforms. You know, it, I'm really curious how they're gonna take care of that uh, to make also the gameplay interesting. Because keep in mind that the biggest issue of you for, and I, probably some of you agree on that with me, is that the game you, you scale too fast, especially if you play well. And by 1550, 1600, the game becomes boring. So you don't even play past absolutism or revolutions. And if you play, it's often pain. So I'm looking forward for the future that is handling that. 
See, here we've got, I think these are reforms that will be in game. The language of Polydink, and so we'll be able to choose between card language with some bonuses and common language with the other bonuses, but obviously we don't know much about this. These are the two available possibilities of the law language of Polydink uh, for the country I tested. So something that is different from reform is what we call a law. A law can have several different policies you can pick from, and several laws have unique policies only available to center tanks, religions, cultures, governance types, and other factors. There are some drawbacks to adding new reforms or policies, though, as it takes a few years for it to have full effect. It's not like you just click and you get it, uh, the bonus, but it's gonna take time. And it's gonna depend on your admin efficiency, which is also confirmed is a completely different mechanic in EU4. So uh, we'll see how it works. My assumption is uh, admin efficiency is how fast you um, can pass reforms and reform your country and make changes to policies, etc. Then we've got some information about the parliament. So it says that you will be able to call a parliament. And if you don't do that regularly, the states will get mad at you. And further in the comments, uh, Johan will be clarifying that you can call the, the parliament every two years. And if you don't call it in five years, uh, the estates will start getting angry. And what's interesting, in each parliament there will be some agendas you want to complete, but also estates will be coming with uh, the requests. So there might be a situation that, oh yeah, we're gonna accept your demands from Crown if you do X, Y, Z. Sounds like... Polish elective monarchy 2.0. There will be also a cabinet as a part of the uh, government and they're saying here that this cabinet will be a hybrid between EU4 advisors, which you know very well, and uh, CK2 council actions. So there will be no advisors themselves in EU5, instead we'll have an actual cabinet in our government. If you played EU2 on EU f uh, or EU3, you might very well remember something that we called sliders. In Polish, Suwaki. <laughs> and the sliders were the domestic policies where you are, over time you're going from between centralization, decentralization, aristocracy and plutocracy, uh, land and naval, quality and quantity. So this will be back in U5, of course, completely refreshed. And see, uh, they are bringing this idea back, but it will not be in a domestic policies, instead it will be societal values. And as you see, there will be 13 different societal values. So there will be a lot of to take care of this sliders. I'm not sure if there's going to be sliders like it was. Maybe just going to be something similar. Societal values are primarily affected by what other actions you do. Like what policies you pick in law, what reforms you pick. As with so many other things in our game, this is not an instant action, but a gradual change over time. It might be even a thing that it's it's not an actual slide that you move it manually, but depending on what you do in with your country, this go back and forwards. Oh look, it's EU3. So next week they will go into much more detail about estates, how they work. Okay, but before I go into the comment section, let's take a look at the map. Because this is pretty much the first sneak peek of uh, how part of Europe is gonna look like. So somebody only drew borders, like just looking at this map. You see, if you take a look at this, uh, you'll see that there are actual borders visible with these lines. These are the borders. And uh, based on this, you see, this is Byzantium. There are Ottomans, Kandar, Eretna, Mamluks, Jalararit, uh, Golden Orge. And this, I saw even a better map. Yes, with actually colored borders. This is the expected map of this region in 1337, because that's that's what most this region looks more like in 1337. So it's another confirmation that it has to be U5, another confirmation that it is in 14th century, and most probably the start date will be with the start of the Hundred Years War. It's really interesting because Byzantines are still more or less decent in the region and their power, but uh, looks like the Ottomans will be a new Byzantium in this region where you can grow it and uh, make it super strong. We'll see about that. All right. There's also, I found also another post from the Primal Earth on um, Reddit where he posts the borders of uh, Byzantium based on that map. And also somebody on Reddit posted uh, EU4 map from Extended Timeline and of how Europe looks like in 1437. So you'll see here that uh, the borders are more or less similar. Obviously, the, uh, it cannot be so in U4 like you'll be able to do here because there are just so many more locations. And also, uh, if you go back, you remember how we were looking at uh, India and at Persia. These are also very similar borders to what you saw in the previous Dev Diaries and same for U1. Well, yeah, I want to go through the comment section, Tinto Talks. First question, but please make the 
UI's cable, I'll pay extra and <laughs> don't give them ideas. But yeah, Johan is saying it will be 100% scalable, so it's good for people with bigger screens. Mr. Anderson, welcome back! We missed you! <laughs> yeah, another thing that people were reviewing is uh, the colors on the map. So I saw people commenting, oh, it must be who controls that sea. Um, and my thought is uh, not necessarily. Um, we'll see over time. But I think this colors on the sea, it might be related to trade. Like, this is a trade of Alexandria. Uh, this is a trade of Aleppo, this is a trade of Constantinople, and unless this is a different color, so, um, uh, it might be a bit different, but uh, we don't know, this is Black Sea trade, or maybe it is a trade with specified who is controlling it, or maybe this is a trade value of the, pro like this is a trade node and with the different colors are different values, I don't know, but uh, it definitely means Something. Let me know in comments what you think this might mean, these colors. I do like the sea tiles giving gothic stained glass wipe. It's a unique color per location. So, it, it might be just different sea regions, right, with different colors, but... Yeah. Please tell me that these states will have something to do with the population economics mechanics of the game. Instead of just existing as their own little disembodied thing with no connection to the material conditions or the state. Yes. So that's what I was mentioning earlier. Yeah, the illustration is one of the possible backgrounds for a menu. How customizable are the current types? Can we set the turn limits of the Pokemon rulers, for example? Very much custom customizable. Are interact rooms a thing? Yes, they are. When do you refer to countries that aren't based on owning locations on the map? It will be more in the different dev diaries. And he did not say it's not 1347 that's the start date. Will the UI be changed compared to an uh, currently basing one for testing purposes during development? absolutely keeps changing and there's also no artwork yet. I also think that the UI so far it's very basic and I hope it will just get better over time. Another confirmation is most probably 1437 with the borders of Byzantium visible here and here. Economy of review will come in a few weeks so it's really good because somebody was wondering if there would be good old ducats or more like uh, Victoria free currency. The term core province lost all meaning in U4 as you could turn any province into core in a few years by spending a bit of mana. Will Project Caesar maybe have a more similar conception of core provinces as in EU3. Neither like those, but something different. That's all, I, I keep saying that. I'm really glad that trying to make EU5 very distinct from EU4, because uh, if it's gonna be a similar game, obviously it's gonna have less content than EU4 after 10 years of development, 12 years by the time it goes out. And so if it was the same, but with less content, people would just hate it. But at the same time, so it's it's great at making it different because it's a fresh gameplay, a hundred years earlier, different things to, to learn. Uh, but it's also a big risk because if you make it very different and it's not fun, people are gonna hate it and make it Imperator on 2.0. So I'm really having my fingers crossed it's not gonna happen. Another confirmation is 1337 with another map, which is actually a bit different uh, to what we saw in different pictures, but it's very cool. <laughs> in late game, you have so many seats you'll need to uh, Placate that it gets tedious, and it's fine for early game. The seat system of EU Parliament was shit. It did not age well. well I actually do agree because it's just very, it's very manual work. You have to choose the provinces where you put seats of the Parliament, or you let the game do that. And it's also a good com comparison of like how many relocations we have in EU5 versus how many provinces we have in EU4. You see how much it's gonna develop. Will EU4 type mission tree make a reappearance in Project Caesar? Keep in mind, similar mission trees were also already in Imperator already. No, there will be very likely be another type and style of mission trees. Looking forward, what it's gonna look like? Uh, is gonna, of course, Imperator is a bit different because you could have multiple mission trees for a nation, uh, but. Hopefully it's not gonna be Hoi 4 type of mission tree. Damn! The more I hear about Project Caesar, the more I'm disappointed. Mission trees are great! Hope you reconsider. Or perhaps this changes into something different, like the journal entities in Vicky 3. Please clarify. I actually hate the journal entities in Vicky 3. I, I like... I didn't play Vicky 3 enough, but, but I don't like this feature. I said no to eu Force time mission trees. Nothing else. And that's correct. We did just read that. Johan, I'm asking for a description of the map showing central Europe of this project. Please. Soon. Are we gonna be able to take individual locations in the wars? 
Yes, and I think that was already mentioned like two dev diaries ago. It could be Stellaris 2 times on 1337, 501337. This is also interesting. Ottomans in 1337 summer. Ottomans will conquer this in 1337 autumn. I, I just love this comment, guys. This is really interesting. This was probably asked already in a previous Tinto Talks, but would mana be making an appearance in 5? There will be no mana, guys. That's gonna make the game completely different than U4. This is a big comment. First, we, we can be sure that it's 24th May, even the exact date is already set. See, this city has been taken by the Ottomans and in released maps in Tinto Talk. They have got a map from April 2037. We've got May 1337, where there's this little difference, <laughs> like, actually, June 1337, yes, this land's being taken. And we've got possible subjects of Delhi and Sultanate of Delhi in 1337. <laughs> the guys are just getting so deep into this, guys. Okay, I've read all 27 pages of comments. Whew. If you did enjoy this Dev Diary for you 5 just remember to leave a like on this video. Of course, subscribe to the channel to see the future ones. And let me know what you think about this so far in the comments, because it, it looks really interesting so far. Bye!